Good afternoon. My name is Robin Cox. I'm a visiting scholar here at the Institute, um, as well as assistant professor at the USC Suzanne DeBorg Peck School of Social Work. Thank you for being here today and um, uh, joining the, the Land Use and Regulations panel. Um, this should be an exciting panel. We have um, Rebecca Diamond from Stanford University, Kyle Herkenhoff from the University of Minnesota, <coughs> and Morris Kleiner, who will be presenting um, for uh, who will be presenting um, in place of Lee Ohanian um, from the University of <coughs> Minnesota. Uh, the format of today, we will go in order of the presenters listed here on the program. Each presenter will have 30 minutes, and then we'll open it up to Q&A after that. And hopefully, we'll have about another 30 minutes for Q&A. So without further ado, Rebecca Diamond from Stanford University. Great. So thanks very much for um, inviting me. This conference has already been um, super interesting. Uh, this is joint work uh, with Tim McQuaid, who's my colleague um, at Stanford GSB, and our grad student, Franklin Chen. Um, so just to motivate a little bit, um, this is going to be a paper studying the consequences of rent control. And I think the question of what does rent control really do is becoming increasingly relevant um, in the U.S. It's already a very prevalent policy in Europe. Um, it was more prevalent in the U.S. Uh, sort of after the Second World War. But recently you've seen a number of states and cities both expanding rent control, thinking about expanding rent control, or changing state-level laws that regulate um, rent control in general. So even right now, there's a big uh, debate in California. We're all going to vote on the November ballot uh, about whether we should repeal a California law that restricts the scope of rent control that's allowed in California. Um, and there's, there's lots of ads right now on both sides trying to debate about whether this is good or bad. Um, other states have been thinking about it as well. Uh, Illinois and Oregon, are, they're not voting on it at the ballot box, but their legislators are thinking about changing, changing these laws. Um, so I think there's a gr there's growing interest in U.S. in U.S. rent control. Um, and the top, well, I'm going to be studying this today in the context of the Bay Area. The Bay Area already has lots of rent control. There's many uh, little cities um, outside of just San Francisco per se in the Bay Area, many of which already do have rent control, and it's on the rise. So the last um, big election in 2016, Five Bay Area cities voted on whether they should enact rent control, and they did expand it in two, one of them being Mountain View, which is where Google is. So um, you've seen a pressure both in the Bay Area, in California, and even in the US, an expansion and desire for more rent control. Now, if you ask most economists, you can tell a lot of uh, negative uh, reasons of why regulating price caps or creating price caps could be distortionary uh, in a market. So you don't need it to be about housing, just any kind of uh, price caps without any kind of market failure, you can tell lots of reasons that that's going to cause uh, inefficient outcomes. So if housing is cheap, you might consume too much of it relative to the optimal amount. Uh, rent control often creates a lock-in effect where once you get access to a rent control apartment, uh, it's, you don't really want to give it up because it's either hard to find another one or the amount of rent savings you accrue depends on you not leaving and moving to a new rent control apartment. So that's going to make people stay potentially in the wrong apartments, even if their family is growing and they want more bedrooms, they wouldn't really move to that bigger house because they want to keep their cheap rent. Or maybe a family um, is now an empty nest and they would optimally downsize, but they don't want to give up that third bedroom uh, because it would force them to give up their rent control. So those types of things can lead to misallocation in the housing market. Um, David Otter also has work looking at rent control showing substantial negative neighborhood spillover, so beyond the direct effect on the tenants and the landlords of the rent control department itself. Um, his study in the repeal of rent control in Cambridge, Massachusetts, found that even the nearby housing had substantial uh, negative spillovers from just by being located next door to rent controlled housing. Um, so you can tell a number of negative, uh, bad consequences of rent control. But if you talk to affordable housing advocates who don't generally, be, they aren't usually economists, so they're not usually framing these types of arguments in the same way. Uh, language that we would use. But the general um, argument that I think has some weight is that they talk about these tenants greatly value 
um, being able to stay in their neighborhood. So if they've been in their neighborhood a long time, they've invested in either a social network, their job is nearby, their kids are in those schools, they've sort of attached to that community, and it's very costly and painful from a utility perspective to suddenly have their rents go up a lot, um, and there's not an easy way for them to shield themselves from that risk that their neighborhood now becomes desirable from some higher income group's perspective and they want to move in and drive up their rents. And there's no real insurance market. You can go out there and say, I want to insure myself against uh, rent risk to ensure that if I can afford to live in this neighborhood now and I don't lose my job, I can afford it to go forward. So rent control actually can provide some type of sort of social insurance against um, getting priced out of your neighborhood. And indeed, it's exactly the households that have these reasons that moving would be very costly from a utility perspective, the ones that are at the most risk, right? They can't really self-insure by moving across town to a cheaper area if they've already invested in that local community and have strong preferences to stay there. So I think there are some scopes for thinking about why aspects of rent control could be a socially desirable policy. So before I get into the detail of exactly what we do, I want to give you a quick primer on how rent control in San Francisco um, has evolved and how it works, just so we're all on the same page, because different cities set these policies up a little bit differently in different areas. So San Francisco rent control came in first in 1979. It was decreed by the mayor. Um, and there was the background on this is that Prop 13 came in in 1978, which basically capped property taxes for homeowners. Um, so that if house prices went up, you didn't pay more property tax. And renters felt like they got a raw end of the deal. They said, well, how, if, pro if housing prices go up, how come homeowners seem to get all these savings? Uh, if I'm a renter, if rents go up, I, I pay the cost. Um, so I think that was some of the unrest uh, from the renter's perspective. Uh, and that led to um, them decreeing a cap on nominal rent increases within a tenancy, but not between tenants. So if the market, if an apartment is rented out, I basically can't raise the rent on that tenant, but if that tenant moves out and then a new tenant comes in, I can charge whatever I want for that next tenant. Um, so that's how, how San Francisco rent control works. That's called vacancy decontrol. Uh, when between tenants, when there's vacancy, you, the parking is no longer controlled on the rent. Some cities have vacancy control, which is even between tenants, it can't go up. So we're looking at a context of vacancy uh, decontrol. Now a big exemption of this law when it came in in 1979 um, was that it only covered housing stocks that had at least four, uh, five apartments or more, so large multifamily housing. And again, they were talking about that this type of the housing market, also the, maybe these landlords have market power or something, and we want to regulate uh, the uh, rents of, of these large, large landlords where the smaller landlords were more mom and pop, and maybe we didn't need to regulate them. Whether that's true, I don't know, but that was sort of the, if you read the newspaper, that's what the arguments were discussing. And this exemption was a big exemption. So if you've ever been to San Francisco, small multifamily housing is everywhere. Um, so these sort of two to four unit buildings um, are, I'll show you a map, are, are pervasive across the whole city and made up about 44% of the rental housing stock at the time. So this law basically rent controlled all currently standing large multifamily structures. It exempted new construction because they didn't want to discourage new development. So basically, if you already, your building already existed and you had five apartments or more, you're now rent controlled. This smaller stuff was not, and any new stuff was also not rent controlled. Now over time, um, these small multifamily apartments where you actually could charge market rent became um, arguably increasingly owned by bigger businesses because this is where you can make your money. Um, and then this led to a new vote um, in 1994 where San Francisco voted on repealing this exemption for small multifamily housing. And it barely passed. And basically what that meant is that starting um, at the beginning of 1995, now small multifamily housing built prior to 1980 is now rent controlled. But it left unrent controlled all of the small multi housing built in the 80s and early 90s that already existed, already had tenants in it. So unlike the initial law change, which sort of rent controlled all standing housing, this exemption left standing very similar type of housing, this newer construction, but already built housing that won't face this law change, which is going to be useful um, for analysis. Okay, So we're going to use this law change combined with a new data set um, where we have the near universe of address level migration histories for anyone that's any adult 
that's ever lived in San Francisco. So we can see wherever they move at the exact address level, um, regardless of whether they stay in San Francisco. So our sample obviously is going to be studying people that start off in San Francisco that are going to be affected by this law change, but then we can look at where they go um, regardless of where they move. And we link this data to some uh, information from assessor's records, uh, which is going to allow us to identify whether the, the resident of this property is an owner or a renter, because we know the name of the owner from the deeds records, and we know the name of the resident from our migration data, so we can separate out um, owners and renters. And the assessor data also tells us the number of units in the building and the age, so we can actually figure out which properties were subject to this law change. Now, this natural experiment of expanding rent control on small multifamily housing is going to allow us to then look at what do tenants do when they suddenly get covered by rent control relative to very similar tenants who are living in the same neighborhoods as the, um, those treated by rent control in very similar buildings, in a similar size of building, but just built slightly more recently. So we're going to be comparing tenants living in buildings built sort of in, from 1900 to 1979. What do their migration patterns look like relative to tenants that are living in buildings built in the 80s, but live very close to each other. They moved into the neighborhood at the same time, um, and the, they're going to be very uh, differentially affected by this law change. OK. Huh, I thought I'd skip that. Um, so I told you a bit about the data. This new migration data comes from this company called Infutor. Um, if you want to ever use it for your own stuff, they're a private company that are in the they call it they have, uh, the data cleansing business. Um, <laughs> so basically, they have many sources of address histories for all of us, um, combining things like uh, the header file from your credit record, which has all of the sort of address histories that the credit bureaus know about, um, information from voter registration, information from property deeds. If you have read magazine subscriptions or you subscribe to cable, they sell those things. Um, so this company basically buys all this data from all these different sources, the USPS change of address, um, and puts them all together so it has this sort of unified database of um, your name and all of your previous addresses and when you moved um, between them and your uh, month and year of birth. So that's going to allow us to look at migration in a very detailed way, which in basically any other data set you wouldn't really be able to do. Even if you had the restricted use census data, they'll never give you addresses. And you, we actually need the exact address of where you live to figure out treatment. Just knowing which like, census block you live in is not enough information to figure out which exact building you're in to figure out were you exposed to this treatment or not. Um, so this is, it's pretty cool data you could look at a number of things in. And then we link this to property records and some information from the San Francisco Assessors and Planning Office to sort of learn more about these buildings and uh, what happens to them over time. Um, we've also done some work to figure out the race of the individuals to try to look at differential effects by minority status. So we use um, sort of a two-step procedure where we use some um, software developed by some machine learning professors that takes uh, first and last names and gives you probability distributions of their, uh, their race and ethnicity. So we use first and last name, and then we combine that with the racial distribution of the census block that you live in in 1990, so then we can get posterior probabilities that are very good forecast of your race. Combining those two pieces of information, we only classify you into a race if the max probability is at least 80%. And for most people, conditional on being above 80%, the average probability of the max race is like 95. So this, this is very, very accurate. Census block is very, very small piece of geography, so it's pretty tight in terms of those racial mixes are often very close to 100% of one given race, so that the geography is informative. And then on top of that, we can use your name. OK, so that's sort of putting our data set all together. First, we're going to look at what does this do to tenants? So we can follow the tenants, regardless of where they lived, based on whether they were in this treatment group, namely at the end of 1993, before this law change is coming in, we can look at the tenants that lived in these buildings built uh, in the 1900 to 1979 period, and compare them to our control group, which are other renters living also in small multifamily buildings, but built in built, built, living in buildings that were built in the 80s, as of um, sort of the end of 1993. Now, one big mechanical difference between these two groups that we have to um, deal with is the fact that 
there's no probability anyone living in these control group buildings has lived there for 20 years, right? They, those buildings didn't exist 20 years ago. So if you just do a simple comparison in treatment control in terms of balance and a bunch of observable characteristics, the, things look great, except for we see on average those in the treatment group have lived at their properties for a longer time than those in their control group. Um, so we're always careful to match uh, on the year moved into your property. So we want to compare a treatment person who lived there as only two years at time of treatment relative to a control group person who's also only lived at that apartment for two years. So we basically can't use the people that have lived in their apartments for 30 or 30 years because we have no control group for that type of uh, duration. So with that caveat, once you control for these uh, match on how long they've lived at their property, balance looks very good on all observables. And also, we're also going to be comparing uh, people living in these same neighborhoods. So it's not like we're going to compare across different parts of the city. These are buildings located very uh, close to each other, just built in, in slightly different years. And um, for robustness, you can also use um, a more zoomed in window where you only look at buildings built in the 60s and 70s for treatment to try to match on being more similar. Um, things look very, very uh, similar when you do this restriction. If anything, the effects get stronger. Okay. So our main regression here, we're going to looking at a number of outcomes. So if we have a given outcome, YIT, uh, think of that could be a dummy for, do you still live at the address you lived in at the time of the rent <coughs> control change? Um, we're going to always allow for individual fixed effects. And then we're going to trace out these, oops, these dynamic treatment effects by looking at the differential effect of treatment based on the years since the, the law change and years before the law change. And we'll always control for these year moved in um, cross calendar fixed effects. So that's going to allow these people that have lived in the apartment for one year at time of treatment to just be on some kind of long run trend. Uh, people who've lived in their apartment for two years at time of treatment to be on some different arbitrary trend. And they're only going to be looking within those uh, groups uh, wh whether they're in a treatment building or a control building. And on top of that, we have um, zip code by year fixed effects, um, where this is the zip code of residence at time of treatment, not the zip code you live in um, in any given year. So here's just a map of San Francisco to get you a sense of the coverage of our treatment and control buildings. Um, so up here, this is like downtown San Francisco. So most of this is large, like skyscrapers. So there's no small multifamily. So you're not, I'm not putting any dot in there. So that's why there's no purple or green dots. But you can see the purple dots, which are the buildings that are going to be treated by rent control, are spread all around the city. And there are a lot of them. So there's a lot of small multifamily housing in San Francisco. But the thing to note is the green dots are control group buildings. While they are disproportionately in some neighborhoods, like up here in Richmond, they are scattered across the whole city. So we can do a lot of different, we can compare treatment and control within these local neighborhoods pretty well. The control group has pretty good coverage around the city. And out here, oops, out here, this is all like single family housing. So that's why we just, that's not subject to any of this law change. So we're not studying it. OK, so first, this is just looking at the probability that you know that you still live at your address at time of treatment between the treatment and control group. So you can see right here, in 1995, when the law is changing, there's a quick, sharp increase in the probability of remaining at your treatment address within those people covered by rent control, obviously because now they have rent control. And right away, they're going to be facing below market rent. So even beyond the fact that, oh, I'm going to potentially face below market rents in the future, Nominal rents in the city are shooting up in the background at this time, just sort of uh, citywide. So very quickly, even one or two years under rent control, you're going to be quickly you know, 10 to 30% below market right away. And then you have the additional value of the option value going forward that you might have below market rents uh, that are even larger in the future because these rents are capped going forward. Now, you would expect this effect to kind of decay over time, which you see that it does, because this is the percentage point difference in staying at your treatment address between treatment and control. So it's sort of as more and more time passes, the more and more people just move away for whatever reason. Like eventually we all die. Eventually um, these people are going to give up their apartments. It may take a long time for everyone to do it, but you'd expect these effects to decay. And they do decay and kind of level out. Um, at about sort of a one percentage point increase in the probability of remaining at the address. Now, one percentage point 
20 years later may seem small, but the control group, only about 8% of them are still living at their initial address. So a one percentage point increase relative to an eight percentage point base is, is, is a sizable effect. So it's, it's, it's you know, relevant. So when doing that type of math, you get, depending on exactly what period you look at, sort of between a 13 and 20% increase in the probability of still being at the address relative to the control group. Now, not only are these, oh, sorry. Um, not only are these effects um, positive, they're differentially positive across different racial groups. So you can see for, this is just collapsing it down to a pre-post, so I'm not showing you a full graph for everyone. But for whites, you see there's about a 2.1 percentage point increase in the probability of remaining at your address. Down here, we plot the differential effects, so that you have to add them to the white effect to get the total effect for the different minorities. And you can see for both blacks and Hispanics, there's a larger positive effect. So it seems to keep them in their properties more. Um, we don't find a differential effect for Asians. And one thing to note is our sample for blacks is just not very big. There's a much smaller African American population in San Francisco. And that also makes us, it harder for us to be highly confident about classifying someone as African American because of the information is just the signal is less good. So that's going to make us have a smaller um, sample size, which is why the standard errors are big. Um, now we can repeat this for looking at not just are you living in the same apartment, but are you living in, somewhere, in San Francisco as a whole? So is it preventing um, <coughs> displacement from the city, which is often one of the goals that affordable housing advocates talk about. And indeed, we can see that a large share of those people that are remaining at their apartment, had they been forced to move away due to rent, a absent rent control, they would have left San Francisco as a whole. So you're really seeing it is keeping people in the city that would not have stayed in the city otherwise. And if you repeat this again for minorities, you can see that that's especially true um, for, for black and Hispanic minorities. They're seven percentage points more likely to still be in the city relative to whites. Um, and we also find a slightly more positive effect for Asians. So for all the minority groups, they're especially at risk for getting displaced from the city absent rent control. So from a perspective, if, you're, if this is your goal of the policy, it is sort of doing uh, an effective job at keeping these households um, in, in a city that they wouldn't have been able to afford otherwise. But that sort of makes you ask, well, at, at what cost? OK. So we also look at how landlords may be intervening here. So remember, if you're a landlord here, you're getting you know, a lot of potential profit taken away from you through this law. And if, if you're trying to, you could imagine landlords try a number of mechanisms to try to mitigate their losses. So one thing they can do is try to convince tenants to leave. So a very common policy in San Francisco you read about, it's totally legal, is for landlords to offer a one-time payment to say, please move out. And you might take it if you don't really value staying in that community very much and there's this incentive to move away and live somewhere else, and then landlords are allowed to resent the rent. Now, if you zoom in onto the types of households most likely to be willing to take that carrot to move away and neighborhoods where landlords have the most to offer, namely high rent appreciation areas, so places where the market rents went up a lot, where the landlords are, have a lot of money being behind their, ability, behind their desire to get you out, so they're going to be willing to pay you a lot. And if you look at tenants who hadn't lived in that neighborhood for very long, so they're probably less attached to the community, and if they were, say, were offered $5,000 to move away, they might say, sure, that's great. I'll take $5,000 and leave. And indeed, here we actually find among those tenants, they're less likely to be remaining in their property. So the landlords are saying, please take this money and move out. And they're actually moving out at a higher rate than the, than the control group, because the control group has no carrot to say, please move out. Now, if you compare that to tenants who have lived in the neighborhood for at least four years at time of treatment in those same communities where the landlord likely also is willing to offer them some compensation, those tenants are much less likely to take that offer because they potentially have a lot of invested uh, sort of capital in that area and that lump sum may not compensate them for their losses. And here we see a huge increase in the probability they remain at their address. Indeed, this is probably the only way they can afford to stay in that neighborhood. And if they're not going to take the payoff, then they're really going to want to stay for a long time. So you can see there's a lot of heterogeneity here across types of tenants and across 
um, landlords and their abilities and desire to get you out. So in these areas where the landlords really have a profit incentive to get you out, you can see these really big different effects across different groups. Um, I'm just going to skip that in the interest of time. So to build on how the landlords are responding, now we're going to follow the property over time. So before we were following the tenant, regardless of where they moved, now we can look at what happens to the building itself to see how the landlord responds in response to getting their property covered by rent control. So here, first off, we can just look at a raw population effect. So in our infooder data, we can just count the number of adults we see at each address and see if the number of people goes up or down based on whether the building gets covered by rent control. Now here, I don't think we have a strong prior. You could imagine this thing going either way. So you could imagine if I'm going to uh, build new construction, so if I knock down my old building to build a new building, new building is exempt from rent control, that would be one thing I might want to do. And if I build new construction, I might build more apartments. So then population might go up. But if I'm trying to maybe uh, convert my building to condo and then sell to an owner-occupied uh, household, then I might actually try to combine apartments and make bigger apartments because those households might prefer bigger apartments than cheaper, smaller rental units. So that might lower the population. So I don't think we have a strong prediction on just who, how many people will live there. And indeed, we have sort of a noisy zero it doesn't really look like population goes up or down. Maybe it goes down a bit, but it, not, not much to really say there. However, we have much stronger predictions on whether the number of people living in the building will still be renters. So here we see a 15% decline in the number of renters living in these buildings uh, because we can just compare their last names again to the property owner so we can figure out who's a renter and who's an owner. Um, and this is being offset by an increase in owner occupants. So we see an eight percentage point increase in whether owner occupants are now living in the building. So you can convert to condo and then sell this off on the regular market. If it's an owner occupied apartment, there's no rent anywhere, so nothing's rent controlled, and you can monetize the full value of your building. And we do see this um, substitution. Um, further, if you actually look at the uh, supply of renters living in rent controlled buildings, um, the decline is even more. So we see as, whoops, 25% decline in supply of rent controlled buildings. So you might be asking yourself, why are these two things different? So another thing you can do is knock down your old building, build a new building, and rent it out. But that new building would still have renters in it, but it wouldn't be subject to rent control anymore because it's new construction. So when you pull out those sort of new development buildings that are still rentals, and look at how many rent control properties do we still have, you see an even larger decline. And indeed, looking at the supply of new, uh, new construction of renters and new construction buildings, you see that increases by 7%. So you can see, over the longer run, these landlords are finding ways to decrease their supply of rent controlled housing and replace it with types of real estate where they actually can, can earn, earn more of a profit, which is what you might expect. Um, and if you look directly at data on condo conversions, you also um, see it here. So you can see this sort of flat and then very sharp linear increase in converting to condo. One reason that's so perfectly linear is that condo conversions are highly regulated in San Francisco and capped and essentially lotteried off um, to people who want to convert to condo. And there's a big application process to, to even be eligible for that lottery. And then they put a moratorium on condo conversions, which you can see right here. So likely, if this had not been regulated, this would have an even steeper, steeper effect. Um, you also can look directly at the renovation permit data. So contrary to this um, sort of simple model of where landlords may invest less in their properties because they have rent control because they can't recruit the profit, we actually see landlords investing more. And that's becoming from the fact because Instead of deciding to just accept the fact of rent control and let their properties decay, they can invest in renovating and converting to condo and building new construction as ways to exempt themselves from rent control. And that creates an increase in renovation and upgrading of housing. And now, because the types of housing which are exempt from rent control, both owner-occupied and new rental construction, both of those types of housing are going to cater to a much higher income type of clientele who's able to afford to put down a down payment to be an owner occupant or pay for new construction, you know, more luxury type, type rentals. Um, so this effect likely fueled gentrification of the city by changing the housing supply to cater more to high income tastes. So we can look at that, um, albeit somewhat indirectly, 
Uh, we don't actually have household income to, to actually see if higher income people are moving into these treated properties. But we can proxy pretty well for these household income by looking at the census tracts they used to live in. So we can compare the treated properties, uh, look at the tenants in those properties, and look at the tenants in the control properties, and then look at the census tract characteristics of where they came from. So if you're a higher income household, you're more likely to have used to have lived in a high income neighborhood. So that's going to allow us to proxy for this difference in income between these two groups. And indeed, we see um, the average treated property under rent control in 2015 has tenants that are about 2.8% higher income, as measured by the per capita income of where they used to live um, 10 years earlier. Now, that may seem small, but if you remember, only 15% of the properties were really renovated and redeveloped. And if you think that these higher income tenants are actually living in the subset of properties that went through this renovation, um, then you can sort of blow up that 2.8%, and that would suggest that the renovation incentivized properties due to rent control actually brought in about 18% higher income residents to those properties. So it really does look like um, it increases uh, the, the high income population in these neighborhoods. OK. So just to sort of put it all together, I'm almost out of time. Rent control is sort of their pluses and minuses. From the perspective of ensuring tenants that they are able to stay in a neighborhood they can afford, we do see that they, this policy prevents displacement from the city. And indeed, it disproportionately just prevents displacement among minorities, which might also be um, part of the goal of these policies. But it does this in a way that has a large amount of cost. Right? It creates this incentive for landlords um, to distort their housing supply to characteristics that really undermine the goals of what rent control potentially is trying to do. Um, it lowers the supply of housing and replaces it with higher end housing, bringing in um, richer clientele to the city, fueling gentrification, and ultimately drives up the rents of the city overall because there's less housing to go around. So in the short run, it sort of looks like it helps those tenants, and those are the tenants that get to vote in rent control law passages, the ones that currently live in the city, and hurts the tenants in the long run that are going to face this different housing supply and these higher rents. And to the extent that these long run tenants don't live in the city at the time of the law change, their voice is not heard in these types of um, votes, which suggests that municipal regulation of rent control can really be inefficient because it wouldn't account for some of these longer run changes. And state level regulation may be a more desirable um, way to, to, to limit the scope of rent control. Now, all that is to say that the, the problem here we're really seeing is about distorting on how we fund some type of um, insurance against getting priced out of your neighborhood. It's not that it's necessarily per se bad to provide insurance against this risk of, of no longer being able to afford your neighbor, a neighborhood you've invested in. It just may not be the most efficient way to fund it where landlords have many alternative options and they can substitute to those things. Um, so potentially an alternative way to do it would be some type of more government regulated social insurance program. In theory, you could imagine tying some kind of tax credit payment to neighborhood level rents. HUD is already collecting this data for FMRs for vouchers, so it's not like we don't know neighborhood level rents. Um, and that could allow for some potentially uh, more desirable properties. It wouldn't tie uh, tenants exactly to a property they live in. Um, but obviously, to work out all these details is much more of a future research question. Thanks. Thank you. Awesome. Next up is Kyle Herkenhoff. OK, so it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I'm going to present some work on land use restrictions and, and US economic performance. Um, to motivate this, uh, regional resource reallocation has been a central feature of the U.S. economy for the greater part of the last 200 years. 1800s, it was a westward expansion as people moved to the Midwest and the Great Plains. From the 1800s to the 1900s, we saw urbanization as people moved back to the cities. And in the mid to late 1900s, we've seen a large influx into California. In 1900, California's share of the U.S. population stood at around 2%. Uh, it was similar in size to, to Kansas, but smaller than uh, Alabama, Iowa, and Kentucky. By 1990, California's population share was close to 
Um, relative to constant employment share, so there's just been general population growth, relative to constant 1950 population shares, California has gained by 2010 an additional 15 million individuals, Texas 9 million, Arizona 5. And on the decliners, the big decliners were New York, Pennsylvania, uh, much of the Rust Belt, Illinois, Ohio, and Michigan. Um, the way we're going to view these reallocations is uh, our regional evolutions in productive opportunities. We're going to view the population moves as people moving from less productive regions to, to more productive regions, from less desirable locations to more desirable locations. And recently, these regional population evolutions have slowed down. So the number of papers that have documented that uh, interstate migration rates are almost at uh, half of what they were uh, in the past. And I'm going to show you some case studies, but in particular, California's population share stopped growing in 1990 despite uh, enormous productivity growth in, in California. So there's going to be three case studies that we're going to highlight throughout the, the talk. Uh, the blue line is the employment share for California. As you notice, it was climbing up until about the 1990s. And then tabletops, despite uh, enormous productivity growth in California. New York, uh, uh, like much of the Rust Belt, actually is steadily declining over this time period. And Texas is, is doing the opposite, steadily growing over this time period. Now, the timing of this tabletop and uh, what's going on here in California is going to be the, the focus of this paper. I'm going to show you a few more uh, summary graphs. Um, one thing that's striking and that we're going to highlight as we go through the paper is the decline of the Rust Belt. So uh, here we've got almost one out of every three workers. So this is an employment share. One out of every three workers was in the Rust Belt in the 1950s. By 2014, that number dropped to about uh, 20%. And then we've seen for California an enormous increase, almost a doubling in the fraction of employment shares, and as well for Texas. Um, at the same time that the regional reallocation has, has declined, we've seen a, a number of other coincident events. So we've seen a decline in U.S. economic performance. John Haltwinger and co-authors have, have documented that in great detail. Decline in business dynamism, et cetera. We've seen an increase in house prices and house price dispersion. So between 1940 and 1970 in the census, California's house price premium was about 30% over the rest of the U.S. By 1990, the premium was about 260%. We've also seen uh, large declines in state income convergence. So uh, Peter Ganong and Shoag have, have shown this in, in a paper. I should also cite uh, Lisa's work there too. So there's persistent income premium in states with large house price premium. So what I'm going to show you next is analysis that ties these three events together. I'm going to draw on joint work with Leo Hanian, who's at uh, uh, UCLA and a consultant here at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, as well as Ed Prescott, who's at ASU and a, a consultant here at the Federal Reserve. Um, so what we're going to look at is how these three trends are tied together through tighter land use restrictions. We're going to analyze how these land use regulations have affected U.S. macroeconomic performance, as well as these uh, regional real reallocation trends be between these regions. All right, so um, what motivated this paper is actually a, an anecdote. So this is, uh, all, these are all the companies, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, et cetera, that uh, uh, were financed through a Sand Hill Road VC. So Sand Hill Road is in Palo Alto, um, very successful in, in, in financing some of the, these major companies that most people here know and, and probably take advantage of their services. Uh, but on that same road, they share uh, space with, with uh, ranches. So due to zoning restrictions, actually, uh, in the area, um, we actually have uh, enormous uh, acreage that's uh, devoted to, to ranching. Um, it reflects both the zoning restrictions and the opportunity cost of the land. Some of this is zoned, actually, as commercial land, but there's no buildings on it. There are building height restrictions, very strict building height restrictions in and around the Sand Hill Road area, which alter the opportunity cost of the land. Um, so let me describe in words what we're going to 
to do here. We're going to use a neoclassical growth model that incorporates a fixed factor land as well as endogenous production of housing. The basic model is going to uh, uh, include consumers who are going to choose not only how much to work but how much to save in, in capital, where to send labor, where to, to work, and then they're going to use uh, land and capital to produce. Um, land is going to be an input into the housing and production of final goods. And that's where we're going to, to focus in this talk. We're going to model 48 states. Uh, uh, we're going to exclude uh, Alaska and Hawaii. Um, and these states are going to have the following exogenous attributes. They're going to have differences in total factor productivity, the amount of land per state, land regulations, and amenities. And the way we're going to model land regulations are anything that raises the cost of land or reduces its productivity. So to conduct this analysis, we actually ideally would have measures of TFP across states, the amount of land across states, direct measures of land use regulations, and amenities going back in time as well as in the present. It turns out of the list of things that we want, only land acreage is, is available and at our disposal. Um, what actually prevents us from measuring the TFP is actually we don't have good measures, we don't have any measures of capital stocks across uh, the U.S. states. It's actually su surprising to me, um, and I don't uh, exactly understand why that is. Um, all right, so with this model in hand, what we're going to do is use the model to infer what those amenities are, those land regulations and TFP, by looking at some related time series. So we're going to focus on state house prices. We actually do have measures of acreage of land, urban acreage, which is an important distinction here, state employment shares, and state labor productivity. So our analysis is going to involve exogenously changing our inferred land regulations and looking at how GDP, TFP, and the location, excuse me, labor productivity and location of workers change. Um, we're going to look at uh, a land deregulation policy that would move the, the contiguous U.S. states uh, somewhat closer to Texas levels of zoning. So Texas has some of the most lax zoning laws in, in the U.S. We're going to look at moving a bit closer to Texas, something like a quarter of the way towards Texas. What we'd see is that uh, U.S. GDP per annum would increase by about $130 billion. If you add that up over the last decade, it would be about $1.3 trillion. And it generates substantial, would generate substantial population reallocation with California and the mid-Atlantic, which is actually a bit surprising, but I'll explain why that is when I get there, and New York growing substantially, and the Rust Belt in the South continuing uh, to decline. So uh, for simplicity, we're going to assume that there's a representative household that chooses where to locate family members. That's what's going to make this analysis tractable. Um, their decision takes into account the TFP, amenity, and land use regulations of each state when they choose where to locate their family members. At the margin, households are going to be indifferent between reallocating family members across regions. For simplicity here, we're going to assume that there's no moving costs, that, that labor and capital are, are completely mobile, and that markets are competitive. Um, let me show you the, the, the sequence problem. So households are going to choose how much capital to put into the business sector, how much to put into housing, where to locate their workers, where J is an index of states, how much land to rent in housing, how much land to devote to, to output of the final good, and uh, how much to rent in each region, as well as how much to save going forward. To maximize their flow utility over consumption, a disutility of leisure, and we allow for an additive amenity term. So A sub J is amenity in state J, and N sub J is how many people are sent to that state. Subject to a budget constraint, consumption plus investment plus housing expenditure is less than or equal to your income from, from workers, your rents from land, and returns on capital. Now the capital can be split up across states and within states it's split up across final goods production and housing production and then workers again are split up across states. The, the constraint that's going to, to matter the most in our analysis is the fact that you can't put more bodies than houses in a given region. Um, lastly, the land is going to be given. It's, uh, that's something we're going to observe and uh, urban land we're going to observe. And then we're going to allow the household, though, to endogenously split that up between commercial land and uh, residential land. 
in terms of production, there's going to be a competitive uh, output producer that's going to choose how much capital, how many people to hire, and how much land to rent, subject to this production function. And I'm going to discuss this alpha term uh, in a moment. They pay the wages, they rent the capital, and they rent the land. We're going to allow potentially for agglomeration, so we're going to allow for some external effects of output. In the baseline, I'm going to, to turn that off. And this A sub JT is uh, TFP. Uh, for housing, good production is going to occur uh, according to this function G. They're going to choose how much uh, capital to rent to produce houses, how much land to rent as well. Uh, the relative price of housing to the final output goods is given by PJT. This is a production function that takes in land and, and capital. They rent capital and they rent land. Now, these alpha terms that show up that are multiplicative on the, the land rental in both sectors are going to reflect what we're going to call land regulation policies. So you can think of alpha as uh, uh, reflecting any sort of policy that lowers the productivity or lowers the effective units of land when, when used for production. Examples may include zoning, environmental rules, as well as uh, uh, building restrictions. What we're going to do is estimate these through the lens of the model, and then there is a one cross-sectional survey. I don't know if Ed Glazer is here yet, but he put together some data actually in the cross-section in 2008 of what these regulations are across states. We're going to show that we, we correlate highly with uh, the Wharton Land Regulation Index. And then lastly, there's an aggregate resource constraint. So uh, what we're going to do is map this model to the data. We're going to, map, we're going to model all 48 states, as I, as I mentioned before. But to make the graphs uh, uh, more palatable, we're going, to, we're going to split out California, New York, and Texas as individual states but then lumped together the rest of the states into five regions, the Northwest, the Rust Belt, the South, the Great Plains, and uh, the Mid-Atlantic. Um, so, uh, uh, so Minneapolis is going to be in the Midwest. And where is that not listed there? OK, that's a mistake. All right, uh, so, um, all right, so let me talk about the utility function. The utility function is uh, fairly standard. Uh, we're going to have separability between consumption and leisure. We're going to have a free sheet elasticity of uh, gamma, as well as these additively separable amenities. So uh, production is going to be Cobb-Douglas. We're going to take the, the cost share of land and housing from some work by Jonathan and, and Morris Davis uh, at 38%. And then we're going to use Bertold's estimate of, of housing, uh, excuse me, of land in, in, in production of 5%. What we're going to do here is an analysis of steady states and uh, in future work we plan to look at transition paths. So how are we going to compute the amenities, the TFP terms, and land regulations? What we're going to do is infer them through the lens of our model from uh, employment shares for amenities. We're going to infer it from labor productivity for TFP. An important uh, point to, to make here is actually we had to build uh, deflators for, for the states going back that are consistent over time. And uh, Turner and, and co-authors have actually used uh, family budget sets. They've dug through some historical uh, uh, BLS family budget sets. We're going to project that using regional CPIs for the periods in which they overlap to construct a consistent uh, set of deflators. So we put that online in case uh, other people are interested in using that. Uh, the land regulations, we're going to infer using house prices. And we're going to assume that the business sector and housing sector have the same regulations for now. In future work, we're actually uh, uh, in the process of, of buying CoreLogic uh, tax rule data for commercial properties, which would allow us to directly observe alpha Y over time. Um, so the housing sector regulations and, and business sector regulations are assumed to be the same. Uh, to infer those, we also had to do a bit of data work. We have single family house prices from the historic census. Uh, uh, we had to actually combine that series got discontinued with the, the ACS for the most recent year. And then the urban acreage also in more recent years was uh, 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 imputed and not uh, uh, consistent over time. So we had to use the census urban land module to to build a consistent time series there. Again, all of this is uh, on our website if anyone's interested in using these time series. All right, so let me talk about identification briefly. So you can almost solve this model uh, in closed form. 
the land regulation parameter is given by this complex expression here. Let me just walk you through a simple example of how the identification is working. So for a given number of acres, which is xj that we observe, a given number of people, and again, there's going to be this amenity decision of locations, for a given housing capital stock kh and a given output in that region yj, so fix all of these parameters, x, k, n, and y, we take these share parameters from the studies that I mentioned before. If we see house prices go up, so if we see this increase, what we'd infer is that there's tighter land use regulations. So I think this is uh, fairly intuitive, makes sense how we're identifying these land restrictions. What we do is a, a, a pulse check. I'm going to show you the time series next. Um, so these are our estimates. These are our parameter values. We infer these in 2014 as well as for all of the steady state, uh, the census years that we have, 1950 through 2000. Um, we're able to back out parameters that allow us to exactly match labor productivity, employment, house prices, and land per capita in each of the states. I'm just showing you California, New York, and Texas here. And again, all of the inferred productivity parameters, the model output we've also put online for each of the years um, and each of the variables. Um, so this is what comes out of the model over time. Uh, what you would notice here is that Texas, this dark black line, uh, is actually looks like and should be, if we've done this properly, the least regulated state. So this, this land regulation parameter alpha, when it's larger, it means the land is less regulated, more productive. In California, what we see is that uh, each unit of land is something like uh, 20 percentage points less productive. Uh, so this red is California and the black is Texas. What we're going to do in the counterfactuals that I'm going to describe uh, later, we're going to move a bit, bit closer to Texas. Um, so in general, one other thing to take away from this graph is that the, the regulatory constraints look like they're actually tightening over time. So as alpha goes down, it's implying that the land is becoming less productive over time. So as a pulse check of our estimation, in 2008, I believe, we have the Wharton Land Regulation Index. What we're going to do is compare our regulatory parameters in 2014 to the cross-section of the Wharton Land Regulation Indices. And what we see is that uh, our model inferred indices are, are, are very close in that cross-section to the Wharton Land Regulation Index. We see a correlation of the ranking of uh, relative regulations of about 80% between the two indices. And we also see if we use other, other measures of business regulations, a relatively high correlation. We do the same for amenities. We compare that to David L. Bowie's measures, which are some of the, the few that we have over time. Um, we also show that our aggregate TFP growth, which we haven't targeted, but we can construct from our state level TFP growth, matches well the Fernald series. All right, so let me show you, let me tell you about the, the, the regulatory experiments we're going to run here. So uh, we think this, what we picked up uh, here are proportional to land regulations in the states. So what we're going to do is take those alpha parameters and we're going, to, we're going to conduct two experiments. The first is that we're going to roll back the land regulations in each state to some previous year. Uh, so there, let's say California tightened up by a certain percent. We're going to roll that back, let's say, to 2000 or 1980s levels of regulations in, in California. And then we're going to conduct a separate exercise, which is, let's say, Texas is the least regulated state in, in our sample. If we move, let's say, a quarter of the way or halfway to Texas and some of the other states, what would happen to, to output and uh, employment? So again, we're picking Texas because it has some of the, the weakest zoning laws. And the counterfactual alpha prime that we're going to consider is yours, and then halfway, moving halfway to the Texas uh, levels of regulatory constraints. So to show you this graphically, the first set of experiments I'm going to conduct is we're here in 2014, and we roll back the regulations to, to the year 2000. I'm also going to conduct experiments where uh, I roll that back to the 1980s. And then finally, we're going to conduct these experiments where we move closer to Texas levels of regulations, either in the year 2000 or in 2014. 
Um, so we've done, actually in the paper, we have uh, even looking even further back in time, but just time constraint. Yeah, we're, we're already, f we're going to find relatively large results and then, um, yes, you get even bigger results if you go further back in time. Um, okay, so let me tell you about what happens if we deregulate California and New York alone to their 1980 and 2000 levels of regulation. We see if we move back to their 2000 levels of regulation, we see an increase in the share of employment in California of about 5% and in New York of about 5%. Go back to 1980s, we see enormous flows into California and into New York, simply because New York tightened their regulations enormously over that time period. Where would they draw uh, these individuals from? We primarily would see them drawing from the Rust Belt and from the South as well as the Midwest. If we compute, if we compute uh, between 2000 and 2014, so if we deregulate in 2014 back to one of these earlier levels and we compute growth rates in output and TFP between 2000 and 2014, what we would see is that we'd see an increase in annualized TFP growth rates of about 0.1 percentage points if we go back to 2000 levels and about 0.4 percentage points if we go back to 1980s levels. TFP growth rate's about uh, half a percent per annum below its historic trend, so it's about 2% per annum instead of 2.5%. So this gets us quite close to being back on, on trend. We see similar values for, for output. We'd see relatively large responses in output if we even just deregulated California and New York to 1980s levels. Um, now what I'm going to do is show you when we deregulate all states back to the 1980s and 2000s. Uh, so here, what we're going to see is actually an increase. If we go back to, to 2000s levels of regulations, a large influx into the, the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic. The reason this occurs is that the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic, we infer a relatively high amenity value of, of living there. It's got the right combination of productivity and amenities that would draw in uh, individuals from both the Rust Belt and South. California and New York would, would gain as well. And then if we go back to the 1980s, we see relatively similar behavior, except we see a much larger uh, increase in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic, again, coming out of the Rust Belt and the South, as well as the Midwest. Um, all right. So if we compute output and TFP growth rates in those experiments, what we would see if we computed uh, TFP growth rate, we de deregulate all states to the year 2000, and we compute TFP growth rates between 20, 2000 and 2014, we see that the TFP growth rates would increase by 0.2 percentage points and output would increase by about uh, 0.2 percentage points. That would allow us to close this gap in TFP growth by about 50%. And if we deregulate all states to 1980s levels, we would entirely close the, the gap in the current slowdown in TFP. I don't know why this is not responsive. The battery may have just died. All right, uh, I wonder if I click. All right, there we go. All right, so uh, this is a time series. If we show the, the TFP, uh, the aggregate TFP in the US economy, if under these uh, counterfactuals of deregulating to the year 2000 and 1980s levels, uh, this is what the, the log solo residual looks like. Uh, it's growing at about 2.5% per annum. The slowdown that everybody is talking about is this black line. Uh, TFP growth slows down by about half a percentage point per annum in the most recent uh, 15 years. Um, if we deregulate all states to the year 2000, what we see is TFP growth rates would increase uh, about, by about half of what uh, would take us back to trend. If we deregulate all states back to the 1980s levels, TFP growth rate would increase basically bring us back to, to trend growth in the solo residual. Um, could you, somebody click the slide for me? All right, so if we, if we deregulate all states halfway to, to Texas levels of regulation, so um, this is uh, 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 moving, let's say, partially uh, uh, towards uh, uh, zoning free laws, excuse me, 
excuse me, moving partially towards not having zoning laws, although there's other components of uh, Texas land use regulations that are not just uh, zoning. What we would see is a large increase in both uh, uh, employment shares in California and the Pacific Northeast. Texas would actually lose, as they have in, in all of the other prior graphs that I'm sh I've shown you. If we deregulate a quarter of the way to Texas, this is what we would see. If we deregulate halfway to Texas, we'd see enormous inflows into California and uh, uh, the, the Pacific Northeast. These inflows could be associated with severe reductions in amenities in those regions. And in the paper, we go through and we, we link the amenities to, to population shares, and we show that actually there are still substantial gains from these deregulations to California uh, residents and the representative household as a whole. Uh, could somebody click it again? I, I don't know what's going on here. Okay, so uh, if we compute uh, the TFP growth rate and uh, annual output uh, growth rates under these uh, deregulations toward Texas, excuse me, under deregulating towards Texas levels of regulations. What we'd see if we go a quarter of the way towards Texas, this would close the gap in, in uh, our TFP growth rate almost entirely. If we deregulate halfway to Texas levels, we'd actually overshoot TFP growth rate would be higher than what trend TFP growth rate would, would have suggested. Okay, could I, next slide. So this is just a summary of uh, a number of the aggregates that come out of the various experiments. I've shown you uh, these uh, uh, experiments from columns four to nine. If you're interested in, in discussing this more, I can uh, spend more time on this after the talk. Uh, the ones that uh, uh, we were showing you in the introduction, where those numbers come from, are moving towards Texas levels of regulation. We'd see output increase by six percentage points if we, if we deregulated a quarter of the way to Texas. We'd see output <coughs> increased by 10 percentage points if we deregulated halfway to, to Texas. In each of these cases, we would see welfare gains. If we allow amenities to be a function of congestion and we, we model labor disutility in, in other ways, uh, including a CS disutility of labor, which would also would reflect some form of congestion outside of amenities, we do continue to see positive consumption gains. That's in the paper and is not uh, in the slides. Happy to chat about that after, though, if people are interested. Okay, so just to conclude, um, we've shown here that land re use regulations have tightened over time. We've previously had cross-sectional measures of land use regulations. We collected a new data set. We looked through the lens of this neoclassical growth model and we inferred uh, uh, a time series for land use regulations. We show they're highly correlated with the Wharton land use regulations in the year in which we actually have the two time series. And we've shown that uh, these land use regulations are important for, for determining the allocation of workers across states. Small perturbations in these land use regulations actually result in large regional reallocations. We find that uh, existing, uh, deregulating existing urban land uh, in 2014 back to 1980s levels would increase GDP and productivity by about six percentage points in levels and would close that growth rate gap in, in t aggregate TFP growth. And we find similar results if we move back to 1980s levels. Um, and the biggest winners again here are large inflows to the mid-Atlantic as well as uh, California and New York. Thank you. Next up, we have Morris Kleiner. Will you guys be able to? Okay, I'll just say that. Well, thank you uh, for the invitation to come here. Uh, I am serving as a pinch hitter, so uh, given my role as uh, serving as a pinch hitter for Leo Olian from University uh, from UCLA. Uh, I'm going to present uh, sort of an overview of the topic of uh, occupational licensing and state policies. Uh, and as part of that, uh, I'm going to go through uh, 
sort of the overview of the issue and then uh, present some work uh, that, uh, that I've done with uh, Suyan Han, who's a PhD student, uh, Evan Soltis, who's a PhD student at uh, MIT, and Janet Johnson, who's a colleague at the University of Minnesota. Uh, so I'll uh, sort of summarize uh, these issues and then uh, present some information on labor market churning as well as some of the welfare effects of occupational regulation. But before that, since I spend most of my time at the University of Minnesota, next, I uh, uh, want to give you some Occupational Licensing 101, which is basically a definition of what an occupational license is. So it's really a credential awarded by a government agency that constitutes a legal authority to do a job. Uh, and this is uh, just some of the basic definitions, uh, but next, uh, uh, it is really a government regulation that uh, requires practitioners to obtain a license in order to work, and that's legally required uh, to work for pay. So workers usually uh, obtain a license by satisfying, thank you, uh, satisfying uh, hum minimum human capital requirements uh, such as education and exams and an illustration that uh, most of us are familiar with uh, lawyers in the US are licensed uh, by attending an approved law school if you don't go to the law school in the state of Minnesota you have to go back and, and attend an uh, American Bar Association approved law school uh, and you have to pass an examination so this is sort of bringing everyone up to par, or at least up to speed, on, uh, in terms of what occupational licensing is. Uh, and uh, then uh, this is really an exercise in law and economics. So uh, we give you some basic idea of what, what licensing really is. Uh, so what's been going on with licensing in the US? Uh, so here's a comparison of two labor market institutions. The, th the top line is what's been going on with unionization. In the 1950s, uh, unionization was about a third or more of the U.S. workforce uh, for a number of reasons, employer uh, resistance, uh, changing uh, from movement to manufacturing to services, uh, and institutional changes. Uh, unions have declined so that in the private sector they're about six and a half percent overall, 11 or 12 percent of the U.S. workforce. In contrast, occupational licensing has grown very steadily. In the 1950s, about four and a half percent of the U.S. workforce required permission from government in order to work. And uh, it, that has steadily increased. Uh, so that now, depending on the survey you use, uh, in, in 2006, a survey by Gallup put the number close to 29%. Uh, data in the, in the current population survey put it around a little over 20%. Survey of income and program participation puts the number closer to 20%. So somewhere between 20 to 30% of the U.S. population or the workforce requires permission from government in order to work for pay. Uh, and that is an institution that's grown from about 5% to somewhere between uh, 20 and 30% of the U.S. workforce. Uh, and part of that, a number of uh, reasons for that, uh, movement from manufacturing to services where licensing is prevalent, uh, also the ability to try to get uh, 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 work uh, uh, set up work rules uh, in the licensed occupations or in, in the labor market or in these service industries where licensing or where licensing is much more prevalent. Uh, so all this has led to a significant increase in licensing and, and a decline in another labor market institution. So this includes about 800 occupations that are licensed in at least one state. Uh, if you include uh, workers who are registered or certified, and that is a right uh, to title versus a right to work. Licensing uh, gives workers a right uh, 
uh, to work or, uh, and, and in the case of registration and certification, that is only a right to a title. The, the right to use that in terms of, of, of conveying that information to the population. And about 65 occupations are licensed in all states, and that is licensing coverage, and that's sort of the traditional ones, uh, such as doctors, lawyers, dentists, to a number of other occupations that have more recently become licensed in, in healthcare, for example, occupational therapists, physical therapists, and a number of other occupations to include occupations such as electricians. So this is a growing and a very pervasive form of government regulation. Now, uh, why is it important or why should economists be concerned uh, if you include uh, individuals who are in unions and add all the individuals who are covered by the minimum wage, that puts the number around 14 to 15 percent, and that is dramatically less, when you add them together, dramatically less than about the 20 to 30 percent that, uh, that, are, that are licensed by states. Uh, so that uh, when you include, this is a very important labor market institution, very pervasive, and it can have some very significant economic effects, which I'll sort of uh, show you in the time uh, remaining. So uh, this has also been an issue that's grown in terms of popularity. Around 2000, there were very few articles written on the topic, either in the academic literature or in the popular press. Uh, beginning in about 2010, uh, the, for a number of reasons, uh, including uh, the previous administration's interest in the topic, uh, a lot of times uh, we like to think that our work influences what's happening, but it's often events, and Michelle Obama happened to have bumped into an individual uh, who was moving from uh, Fort Bragg in North Carolina to Fort Ord in California. The trailing spouse uh, could not find a job as a teacher. Uh, this family had to go on food stamps. She thought that was terrible. There, the Department of, of Treasury and Defense looked into it. There were a number of white papers that came out as a result of this. And as a result, it moved from sort of a back burner academic issue and back burner public policy issue to one that has seen significant growth both in the academic literature as well as in the popular literature. So uh, the issue uh, largely perhaps because of events, but also perhaps because of the growth of the practice and sort of bumping into people who would be uh, affected by this labor market institution. So uh, what's the geography? Uh, since this is a, a session on what's going on in different places, what's going on in terms of occupational licensing across states? And you'll notice that states like Nevada have about 31% of its workforce is licensed. Uh, Iowa has about a third of its workforce licensed. In contrast, South Carolina has about 12%. So there's huge variation across states in the percentage of the workforce that's licensed. Part of that, a large part of that is due to the industry composition. In Nevada, it's due to gaming. Gaming is heavily regulated uh, in Nevada. In Iowa, uh, that is heavily dominated by the insurance industry. And insurance is heavily regulated. South Carolina, tends to be um, manufacturing uh, a, a, lot, a very high percentage of the workers are in manufacturing in South Carolina, and a very small percentage of its workers are licensed. By the way, and as an aside, if you look at, and a recent survey came out in Europe, uh, the, the variation in licensing tends to be very similar. Uh, in Denmark, around uh, 12 to 13 percent of its workforce is licensed, and in Germany, uh, well over a third of its workforce is licensed. So when you look at the European Union, the variance tends to be very similar to the variance among U.S. states. But certainly the share of the workforce that's licensed uh, 
in the U.S. tends to, to vary dramatically, which is great for researchers. A great opportunity to do a lot of difference to difference or uh, what happens when an occupation becomes licensed in terms of a regression discontinuity analysis. So uh, this allows uh, for some very interesting uh, and hopefully important research in terms of what are the economic effects, both in terms of why states choose to license occupations and its economic effects. So uh, what occupations are licensed? Uh, there's huge variation. Uh, personal care, so wig specialists, hair braiders, body piercers, athletic trainers, and that's an area of, of significant growth dog handlers, land surveyors and florists, uh, handymen, locksmiths, and perhaps it may be good to, locks, to uh, license locksmiths, individuals uh, who perhaps may have uh, been involved in burglary, might not, you may not want them to be a locksmith. Other than that, perhaps it's not a bad idea. And, oh, and uh, over, uh, uh, you, you see uh, professional wrestlers, including the famous Hulkster, <coughs> Uh, Hulk Hogan uh, is a licensed uh, member of a licensed occupation, which include boxers, tour guides, and many other occupations. So this includes the over 800 occupations that are licensed in at least one state with huge variation in some states choosing to license occupations, others choosing to let uh, other forms of regulation influence how those people work. So there's also uh, the, the, the case of Monique Chavon, written up in the Wall Street Journal. She's a florist, and in fact, in the state of Louisiana, uh, uh, florists are licensed. Uh, the, the argument that was made by florists was uh, that it was important in terms of potential in insect infestation. They wanted to make sure that, that florists could, could identify that. It was not uh, because of giving a bad bouquet might uh, ruin, completely ruin a relationship. Uh, and there have been uh, examples of florists uh, making bouquets in Louisiana and in the adjoining state of Texas. And the expert panels were not able to uh, de determine whether they were made by the licensed uh, Louisiana florists versus the unlicensed Texas florists. So there's huge variation and all sorts of uh, arguable rationale, health and safety being the one that is most often used for why occupations uh, might become licensed or regulated. So what's sort of the rationale or what are options or policy alternatives to occupational licensing? Can you use other forms uh, or, or market forms of regulation to determine that if consumers get a high quality service, since licensing uh, tends to be uh, the case in, uh, or most uh, occupations are in fact not licensed. What happens there? There's market uh, competition and private litigation. Uh, certainly uh, one can think of uh, that being the dominant way to, uh, to determine if a particular service or good uh, meets the market test and a high quality service or product is, is offered. Uh, there's a deceptive uh, trade practices, the, the legal system, uh, and other targeted consumer protections can in fact uh, service uh, workers uh, and uh, consumers. Uh, there are inspections. Uh, restaurants are inspected, but it is very rare to find cooks or wait staff that are licensed, yet the restaurants themselves are heavily regulated. Uh, the same thing is true, for example, in the production of airplanes. Very few engineers who work for Boeing are licensed, but in fact, the output, the airplanes, are very heavily regulated, uh, both by the customer as well as the FAA, a Federal Aviation Administration, looking very closely at the final product. Uh, there's bonding or insurance. Or insurance. Uh, if you hire a tree trimmer or a plumber, oftentimes they are bonded and insured, and that provides consumers with some protection. Uh, individuals are registered by the state. 
or by, uh, you can use private sector methods, such as, for example, Angie's List. That's another way to see if a particular service provider is doing a good job. Uh, certification, which is a right to title, which gives someone, uh, for example, uh, if you are uh, a, a mortgage broker, oftentimes uh, those individuals are certified but not licensed. And finally, uh, the least uh, or arguably the, the, the most restrictive form of regulation is licensing. And that is, in this case, a right to work. So if you don't have uh, the, uh, or a right to practice, if you don't have a license, you can't provide the service. If you do, you go to jail uh, or you're fined, very heavily fined, if you don't uh, get permission from government in order to provide this service. So uh, what are, what's sort of the rationale? The courts, this is an area of law and economics. Uh, former Supreme Court Justice Samuel Jackson said it's important for the state to have an interest in shielding the public against the untrustworthy, the incompetent, or the irresponsible. So uh, it is part of what government does to provide uh, a minimum level of quality for a particular service. Uh, in contrast, uh, uh, Milton Friedman, who uh, wrote about this both in his dissertation and in Capitalism and Freedom, uh, noted that the puzzle is not why we have so many silly licensing laws, but why don't we have far more? And the rationale was it's in the interest of the individuals who are licensed or other groups to band together uh, and try to get pr uh, protection from incompetent or unscrupulous practitioners in, the, in this particular area. Uh, and he says the reason you, you don't want licensing is that the great argument for the market is its tolerance of diversity, from high quality to low quality services, the idea of what uh, Friedman called the Cadillac effect, uh, one can, can have a very high level of entrance, you can only buy a Cadillac or you, can, you can't buy anything at all. The result is a lot of high quality products in the marketplace, but many people will have to go without because of access or their inability to pay for the high priced uh, product. And he applied that to labor markets as well. So uh, what's been the impact of licensing? Uh, and this is an, an issue both of what's called attainment versus coverage. Uh, and the new, there have been a number of new databases which, mether, which measure whether individuals attain or get a license. Coverage is if a particular occupation has a law in that state. So for example, engineers are universally covered, but, lab, but about a quarter of all engineers actually attain a license. The same thing is true with accountants. All, uh, there are laws across all 50 states, but less than half of all accountants actually get a license or a CPA. Uh, if you attain a license, the, the labor market or the wage effects tend to be fairly substantial. Some work I did with Alan Kruger uh, noted that the effects are about 15%. Some more recent work using some other data sets found the effects somewhere between 10 to 15 percent, depending on the database used, uh, the controls, uh, omitted variables, and a number of other econometric issues. But somewhere between 10 to 15 percent uh, wage premium uh, as a result of occupational licensing. Uh, is it due to rents? Is it due to other factors? Uh, that's for perhaps future research to to look at, uh, but it has very small effects on income inequality. Uh, that, that unlike unionization, which reduces uh, variance in, in income, uh, licensing uh, really doesn't seem to do much. And if anything, it raises disparity. The thought experiment would be someone who works as a waiter having to pay more to go to the dentist because there's so few dentists. So in, in, in that sense, there's really a the, the reverse Robin Hood effect, lower income individuals having to pay more for higher quality services because the, the restrictions are fairly significant. 
Uh, the influence uh, in prices, and this is some work uh, that was put together by Abby Wozniak when she was at the Council of Economic Advisors, what are the effect uh, of occupational licensing on prices, and they tend to vary uh, from about 3 uh, to 16 percent in, in health care, uh, mortgage brokers increasing uh, prices uh, depending on what time period and what state, zero to, to about almost 6 percent, work I did with Dick Todd here at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, and some work uh, on dental services uh, that tends to raise uh, prices 4 to 11 percent by tougher regulations. So uh, if, it, if the price goes up, you would expect uh, some basic Econ 101 quality effects. Now, there have been some studies that suggest, one done in the 19th century on midwifery and its effect on maternal mortality, suggested that it did reduce it. But most of the preponderance of the studies suggest that occupational licensing has had almost no effect on quality or services at the point of sale, uh, or when you include the fact that licensing raises prices, which uh, precludes a number of individuals from buying the service, when you include that, uh, then the, the, per, the negative, there are probably negative uh, overall effects. Uh, some work I've done in, uh, in New York, uh, looking at Uber drivers, New York City licenses its uh, Uber drivers, uh, and, uh, and, and individuals are picked up at New Jersey's, uh, at, in Newark, the airport, uh, in terms of either quality, the, the, the quality ratings that the licensed versus the unlicensed New Jersey. In New Jersey, Uber drivers are unlicensed. In New York, they are. Uh, they are licensed. When we looked at the quality effects, there seem to be almost none. Uh, if you look at uh, safety uh, measures such as hard stops or very rapid accelerations, there were no difference between the licensed New York drivers and the unlicensed New Jersey drivers. Other uh, evidence uh, looking at Yelp ratings and other places, there, there seems to be very little, if no effect, uh, in terms of overall service quality, either in terms of safety or quality that, that the consumer sees or rates. Uh, so uh, what are the effects, and this is some, uh, some new, uh, relatively new research, looking at the effect of licensing over time. So what happens uh, to, license, to uh, individuals who are licensed the longer they've been licensed? Uh, one of the effects is that uh, the longer they've been licensed, these occupations are able to ratchet up the requirements. An illustration is physical therapists. 20 years ago, you could go to a junior college and get a, a license to become a physical therapist with some internships. Now you need to be a doctor of physical therapy in order to get an appropriate license. And occupational therapists aren't far behind. So the longer the occupations become licensed, the tougher the requirements and the tougher it is to enter the occupation. Although perhaps quality may be better at point of sale access tends to be reduced. Another issue is grandfathering. So the thought experiment, what if tomorrow all economists were licensed? Uh, the, those of us who are already in the business might experience some rents, right? They, we wouldn't have to meet the new requirements and we would get rents. So individuals who are already in the occupation have real incentives to, uh, to promote licensing and also to, to ratchet up the requirements because we don't have to meet the new requirements. In almost no cases are there examples where individuals are in the occupation. When the occupation becomes licensed, do they have to meet the new requirements? So these are sort of pure economic rents to those individuals who are grandfathered. What happens is licensing, uh, these are a number of different occupations. And when they've been licensed, uh, occupations such as physicians, uh, started to be licensed going back to the 1850s. Lawyers, the same thing. But there are a lot of nouveau riche occupations, uh, such as physical therapists and occupational therapists, who have more recently become licensed. And you can sort of do some difference in difference analysis in terms of what's happened. 
so these are all occupations that are, that are universally licensed. That is, they're licensed across all states with very different requirements. Uh, what happens to uh, an occupation or individuals in an occupation who become licensed? The red line uh, are, are the individuals who are licensed prior to, li in comparison to, to occupations that were not licensed. The trend line is fairly similar in terms of wage growth. After a bit of a dip, uh, individuals work more hours, at least that's what we find, is that individuals are licensed, their trend or their growth in earnings tend to go up much more rapidly than individuals who are not licensed. So this is a, an, an, a way to increase, those, uh, increase wages for those who are fortunate enough to become regulated. Also, in terms of churning, what happens to people who are in licensed occupations? So uh, on, on we, sh we show uh, the probability of switching into an occupation and the, sw and the probability of leaving an occupation if you're licensed. It's normalized at zero uh, in terms of, of the, uh, of, uh, 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 on both the vertical and the horizontal axis. And you'll notice uh, that the probability of switching uh, into an occupation, the only case that is similar to other occupation, uh, is cosmetologists. All the other occupations, uh, the probability of getting into the occupation is dramatically less than comparable occupations. So it's hard to get in, uh, but once you have a wage effect somewhere between 10 to 15 percent, uh, and also you've paid the, the entrance fee, the high fixed costs, uh, on the other graph it shows switch, the probability of switching out of an occupation. And there the probabilities, except for barbers, uh, which is sort of a dying occupation, uh, that very few, that it is dramatically less than those uh, individuals uh, who are not licensed. So you, it, it, it's hard to get in, and once you're in, why would you leave if you're getting a significant uh, pay raise? So uh, labor market churning tends to be reduced uh, with respect to those uh, license with those occupations who are licensed. Uh, so is there other evidence of labor market churning? And this is some work I've done with Janet Johnson at the University of Minnesota. Uh, so is occupational a, light, a barrier to interstate migration? Uh, so this is what's happened over time, as was pointed out earlier by Kyle, that decline in interstate migration uh, has been occurring over time, that uh, the occupational licensing has been growing. Uh, what's the reason for that? And what we find is similar to the churning exercise, that interstate migration uh, normalized at zero is much lower for licensed occupations. For real estate appraisers, it's about 60% lower in terms of interstate migration. Teachers, 40% uh, lower in terms of interstate migration. Uh, and overall, there are some cases that are around zero. Uh, physicians tend to move uh, much more rapidly across states, given their characteristics. Uh, and what we find uh, is that uh, we'd like to have a data set, given migration is fairly rare. Uh, in many cases, it's state by state or board discretion. Uh, and as a result, uh, what we find is that uh, uh, we analyze 22 universally licensed occupations, 16 have state-specific laws, six are quasi-national, and we exploit the data in the American Community Survey uh, for two groups as well as two of these occupations. So what do we find? We find uh, that those uh, who move a long distance, licensed occupations move between states at about 5% lower, when we control for all the selection issues. Uh, the unadjusted rate is closer to 28%. That is, licensed workers move at about a, almost a third less than unlicensed workers. State-specific effects, and there's a, a significant amount of heterogeneity. So what's the punchline? Uh, and this is some work I'm doing with Evan Soltis, a uh, uh, graduate student at MIT, looking at a welfare analysis of occupational licensing among U.S. states. 
So what do we find using some simple economic analysis? Uh, that is what, we, what we, you would think is that licensing reduces supply, but it might increase, de increase demand. You think a particular occupation is of higher quality. So how does it net out? And we come up with a welfare effect of the difference in, from Q to Q prime as a result of the increase in demand, yet the reduction in supply, sort of econ 101 in terms of what effect occupational licensing might have. What we find is that shifting an occupation in a state uh, from entirely unlicensed to entirely licensed increases average wages by about 13 percent, increases hours work, uh, sort of the substitution effect dominating the income effect, uh, but it reduces employment and total hours work between 11 to 5.1 percent, which results in a net welfare loss in our model of about 3.3 percent. There are also large costs to individuals. You have to go to about 1.7 years additional schooling relative to other people with similar education. Uh, when you put that in a present value context, those individuals uh, have to make up about 18 percent of lifetime labor income uh, that's required in terms of occupation-specific human capital, and there's little evidence of consumers' willingness to pay. Uh, so those are some of the overall effects, and I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all of the presentations were very interesting, and I think um, given the time and the fact that we're on a tight time schedule to get to dinner, I will just open the floor up to questions from the audience. Hi. Uh, two quick questions on licensing and one on the rent control study. I was, I'm, I'm always curious when I hear about licensing, when I think of the less uh, highly educated licensed professions. If you live in a certain neighborhood, you always know where you can go to get your hair braided or to get some fresh tamales from people who don't have licenses to provide those services. So I'm curious in the data, how we account for the existence of an informal market and how that might, how much that might uh, change data on uh, prices and availability and things like that. Um, and second, I'm all, when I think of license, the next word that comes to mind is always bonded or insured. And I'm curious how if licenses are reduced or in states where there might be, I guess I'm curious how, how much easier it would be or harder it would be for people to obtain um, insurance uh, for the services they provide if there's not that kind of public role of certifying that these people meet some minimum standard. And then on rent control, I was really curious, uh, and maybe I missed it in your slides, if there was a comparison of the group who lived in the um, 1980 to 1990 housing stock to see how they might have differed. Um, I think you mentioned looking for robustness by looking at the 60 to 80 housing stock versus 80 prior housing stock, but if there were significant differences in the population, because you can imagine people living in housing in 80 to 90 might be uh, different than people living in pre-80 housing. Well, thank you. Uh, in terms of uh, good questions, in terms of how licensing is monitored, and it's generally, since uh, in most states there will be one or two people who might have four or five occupations that they are uh, asked to monitor. But most of licensing is monitored by the practitioners. So if a cosmetologist knows someone else is unlicensed, they're likely to report them, and there are a number of highly visible examples of licensed practitioners turning in unlicensed competitors. And this was a case in hair braiding. Uh, there are a number of other uh, low-income occupations where the unlicensed, uh, where the licensed workers turn in the unlicensed workers to the, to the highway patrol or local police, and they're arrested. Uh, in terms of insurance or bonding, this is one way, this is another way uh, to require certain occupations to post a bond. So if, uh, if someone is providing uh, an un unsafe or, or uh, providing an unscrupulous or incompetent service, uh, 
you can sue them against their insurance or their bonds. So this might be a lesser form of regulation than saying no one can uh, provide this service, which a license does, unless you meet these uh, age, uh, education, testing, and all these requirements, which dramatically increase uh, the, speci the uh, specific skills that are required uh, to uh, provide these services. So on the, the rent control question, um, I didn't, you're right, I didn't get a chance to talk about it, but in the paper, um, we look at balance on a number of covariates. And the main big one you have to worry about is this, what I talked about, which is this differences in how long you've lived at the property, because newer construction is just, you can't live there for a long time. And once you adjust for that, things look very balanced on age and like what neighborhoods you used to live in. Um, so it, what, and we're also also matching on neighborhood. So it looks, it looks um, pretty good in that regard um, in, in terms of pre-trends and things like that. But yeah, we were worried about that too. I had a question for, uh, I had a question for Kyle Herkenhoff. Uh, it's a very involved, complicated workflow that you outlined. Uh, but then in some places, some of, uh, some of the concepts still seem kind of abstract to me. And so you had described uh, identifying what is, uh, what is the effect of regulations as for a given land supply, for a given TFP, the difference in housing prices is regulations. And you sort of, you sort of left, it, left it there. Um, but I started wondering, are, are some other things in these regional or state economies being conflated into that? How, are, this would be like an omitted variable issue. For example, uh, is, are there um, systems capacity issues in these states like California or, or New York. And you know, systems capacity itself is kind of an abstraction. But uh, have, you, have you tried to address this looking for those, those omitted variables? And then a second question, at the end of this modeling, is there a validation step that you would think about for a future study looking, uh, trying to validate were there actually specific regulatory actions that took place in, in, in some of these states? So thank you for the question. It, the short answer is uh, yes. Um, so we've taken into account congestion and amenities, a whole bunch of things you would think would be first order, omitted variables. We don't see those in the data, but uh, we'll let the theory inform it. Um, it's not perfect, but it's the best we have to get land use regulations over time. What, we've, what we're doing going forward is we're actually buying the tax roll data for all commercial properties in the, the U.S. And uh, part of when they assess the commercial properties, they write down the local land regulations. Um, they actually write down the zoning requirements and building height restrictions. And we're using that to build an index of commercial regulation over, over time. And we're going to use that actually as a direct input in, into the model as opposed to inferring it uh, indirectly. But this is something we, we really want to uh, nail. Okay. I'm just wondering if you can comment on licensing related to uh, formerly incarcerated individuals. Uh, do you think it's being used punitively? Have you seen any other research or data uh, related to that topic? Yeah. Well, thank you for the question. And that's an area that we're working on. And a uh, colleague at Harvard, uh, Peter Blair, are looking at the effects of individuals who've committed misdemeanors or felonies on their ability to get a license. And the issue is, in most states, if you've committed a felony, you're precluded from uh, get, ever getting a license. Now, the example I gave was, you may not want someone who's committed burglary to be a locksmith, right? So that might be a, an illustration. But in most other cases, uh, individuals who may have committed a, a, a a felony or uh, any other a violation many years ago and 20, 30 years later uh, uh, are applying for a license and they can't get one. And this even goes down to misdemeanors. And there's huge variations across states and across occupations in their ability to, uh, to get a license. And this, we think, uh, might have an impact on recidivism of individuals who, who may have uh, been incarcerated. So, 
great presentation. Enjoy them all. Uh, my question for each. Rebecca, you said at some point you have these individuals who live in um, this neighborhood for many years, so you say 10 years. And your story was it might be costly if you live for a long time to, to move uh, um, because you know you have invested, you have human capital. So I was wondering if you look at the differential effect on rent control for people with short tenure versus people with long tenure. I don't know if that, that may be an interesting story about the eight years. Um, for Kyle, it just is related to a previous question. How do you exactly identify uh, amenities versus regulation? Because they both have the same things and prices go up. Is it, is it one is fixed and the other is mobile? And if, it's, if that's the story, it could be that amenities, the taste for amenities changes. Like in you know, California, people become really rich. They really value those cows. And so that would be kind of hard to, <laughs> to, to, to disentangle. And, and finally, for Morris, uh, I like your last graph and trying to go at the welfare. But, uh, I assume you know if demand increases, consumer surplus increase. If supply uh, shifts down, consumer surplus goes down. And so, so but which one? You, you get a net loss, but how, how do you identify the net loss? Why is that the fact that demand is big on supply? What, what are the factors that lead you to, to that minus three percent? Right. Well, do you want uh, one? Yeah, to sure. I can start. Um, so thanks. We we look at that in the paper. Um, so we look at heterogeneity in these migration patterns by tenant duration, and we actually have a companion paper where we estimate a full dynamic discrete choice model to try actually to infer infer how much extra utility you gain the longer you're in a neighborhood, and we sort of find that um, in that setting that sort of on the margin of each additional year of being living in a given place is a pretty small impact on sort of the total sort of perceived amenity value, but you could if those differences were between someone who'd lived there one year and lived there 15 years, it can lead to huge differences in sort of how sort of locked in they are in, in inframarginal and in being willing to move. And that shows up in their migration patterns. So, so we have time varying amenities actually in the model. So we back out a time series, we compare that to Al Bowie's direct survey measures and we do quite well. But uh, the way we identify is just from a, a standard intratemporal, intratemporal labor leisure choice. We have consumption, labor, we have wages, and we have house prices. Uh, what that residual in that equation has to be is the amenity that allows us to match where people move. And then that's an input into the regulatory parameter, right? We, we take that into account when we're inferring the, the regulations. But that definitely varies over time. And lastly, uh, uh, I, we presented sort of the boiled down version uh, in, in order to, to fit this. But we do have sort of a, a general model where we look at employment loss being uh, the welfare, what, what's output loss through employment as being our general measure of welfare losses uh, due to licensing. So licensing reduces employment more than it has any effect on shifting out demand. So we can net out that in our model. Okay, we have David and then Bill. Two, two questions, both about distributional consequences. Um, so Morris, I, you mentioned Peter Blair. I was just wondering, he has another paper saying that licensing uh, reduces gender and uh, racial inequality. I'd just be curious how that relates to what you presented. And then closely related, um, Rebecca, your, your conclusion sort of remind me of the kind of discussion of the minimum wage versus the EITC, right? In the sense that, you know, uh, rent control is, is a, is costless to taxpayers, <laughs> as as would be argued by its advocates, right? It's a really, it's a way to redistribute without running any money through the federal government or the state government, right. uh, and so it's attractive. And I, uh, on those grounds, I would, you know, your results make me more positive about rent control than anything I've seen in terms of the, you know, it does at least achieve some of the objectives that its uh, advocates claim, which is that doesn't have to be true. Like I don't think that was very particularly true in Cambridge, uh, prior, you know, when rent control was active. So. I was wondering if you had any thoughts about, you know, whether uh, whether that affects your evaluation or what policies you'd like to see in between. So I mean, I, I completely agree that the, I think the sometimes when I give the longer version of this talk, I sort of make the parallel to minimum wage versus EITC, um, and I, I don't have as much uh, quantitative numbers to perfectly put it in that framework to do the exact same comparisons. But I think if I sort of had to do that qualitatively. My guess is that the, the, the comparison is sort of 
you know, you don't like the minimum wage if it distorts employment decisions, right? If the, if the employers have a lot of options to substitute, that's where the distortions are going to be. Um, uh, but in the rent control case, it's very clear there are really easy things to, to <clears throat> substitute. So the distortions could be even potentially bigger um, on when you either mandate landlords to pay for this or you man relative to mandate employers to, to pay for the subsidy. So I think it's sort of the minimum wage, I think, looks sort of better in that sense than, than rent control does um, because there's just this easy alternative to just sell to these other guys um, where if you substitute to other workers, they can't be at least the same workers. It's just uh, you have to make more of a trade-off. It would be my, would be my sense. But um, all of the benefits of the EITC you would have here other than exactly the annoyance of having to actually have a line item on your budget to actually raise revenue directly for it and make it a salient you know, cost to, to taxpayers, but then you could target much better, right? Rent control, I don't talk at all about this in the paper, but, you know, we find it ex post targeted minorities more, but, you know, we don't know anything about income targeting. There's some survey data from San Francisco that the average rent controlled tenant earns, um, or a third of rent controlled tenants earn above $100,000 in San Francisco. So that's not very precise targeting, which probably with a EITC style thing, you could, you could improve. Uh, just to answer uh, your question uh, with respect to the paper by uh, Peter Blair, uh, yes, he finds uh, that, that licensing reduces uh, income disparities between uh, whites and minorities. Uh, and uh, certainly that, that's a sort of a heavy-handed way to provide a signal that minorities have, haven't committed felonies or haven't engaged in other, uh, uh, that sort of uh, the model that he presents. Uh, he has a, a sequel to that paper, which shows some very significant and important negative employment effects of licensing. So you have to balance, as economists, on the, cost, the social or the welfare effects that, yes, it reduces the variance in wages, but it comes at a very high price in reducing employment, and uh, licensing re uh, eliminates the right to practice, where certification might be another way to provide information in the labor market without having these, dis these very strong disemployment effects. Okay, unfortunately, this will have to be the last question. Um, and if you have any other questions, please um, speak to the presenters during dinner. Um, so real quickly, R Rebecca, if you could think through the real inefficiency, it strikes me the real inefficiency is that they try to target specific properties, which strikes me as inefficient. So when we did price controls for rent uh, during World War II, the issue was the government was artificially increasing demand because we needed a lot of people in San Francisco for the war effort, just like we did in Washington. And, the re and so those owners of that land were going to get true rent. That is, all of a sudden, they were getting more money than fair market return because we suddenly dumped a lot of people into the cities. The response was there are two ways of getting a market response, I can let you get above market rates of return and then let it get bid away. Um, or I just see the queues, which in the case of Washington was tons of people being overcrowded. And you can see entire sections of Washington, DC are World War II built apartment buildings because of the overcrowding and people understood, I can get a fair rate of return if I just build to meet that demand. That's, that's a reason for rent control, just to, to keep people from getting above market rates of return. The, the other issue comes about from inequality. So if you look at Jackson Hole or Aspen or many of these mountainous uh, retreats, uh, workers who work in Aspen and Jackson Hole have to live hundreds of miles away because rich people have decided, again, rent, <laughs> We want to have these views. We want to have this property, and they outbid people. So, so there, it's do we say rents can't go up faster than median incomes, and then it looks different. It, it looks totally different if that's what you're trying to do, is to keep the market from being distorted because rich people can outbid other people, and in which case you you push people out. So when you look at the efficiency. The workers in Aspen and Jackson Hole would say, we, we sure could have used rent control because we, it's almost impossible for us to get to our work. So I think the source of, the, of what's being controlled and whether it's uniform 
or not? And you hinted at this when you said, you know, you may need state regulation as opposed to what seems to be highly inefficient, which is specific buildings as opposed to a premise about uh, whether rents go up with median income, in which case you'd have huge surplus for lots of workers because they actually get to participate because they can afford it. Kyle, I, I guess I'm not convinced. Regulations are in response to amenities, and in the case of California, as was mentioned, I mean, uh, this is water use. Most of California that's occupied is desert. <laughs> uh, getting enough water there is a problem. Uh, pollution. I'm not sure I want to go back to the Los Angeles of 1980 and look at the smog. So I'm I'm not understanding what 1980 California regulations today would mean if it doesn't mean smog, buildings that with, cannot withstand earthquakes, uh, and 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 the crisis we were having before, which was California was going to drain the Colorado River, which they practically have anyway. So in regards to the, the rent control comments, I think um, there's a broader question of the goals of rent control policy. I was focusing um, on one aspect you hear a lot about, which is to prevent displacement, which um, I sort of view as like an insurance aspect of rent control. I think um, you can definitely hear other arguments about <coughs> just per se fairness, and I think when you have policies like where rents just say permanently low on an apartment regardless of who lives there, even between tenants, um, you need more of an argument like that about to, to, to rationalize some type of regulation like that. And you see, I mean, a lot of Europe has that style of, of rent control where apartments are just permanently set to be at some regulated below market rent and then you wait in a queue for a long time. Um, that's beyond the scope of our paper about what those policies do just because we don't see them much in the US and they're not the data we observe. In terms of the World War II comment, there is research by Dan Fetter that shows that, that, that the price caps post-World War II pushed up the home ownership rate a ton. So I think even there, they did create distortions of people substituted to home, home being an owner-occupant because then you didn't have to deal with all the rent control regulation. You actually could own a home or if you could find somewhere to live because it wasn't regulated. But thanks for the comments. And what we had in mind was just think of the peninsula in California near San Francisco. There's building height restrictions. We have the technology to build high, but we don't let them. That's what we're thinking. We don't want smog in California. <laughs> but we have technology that we're not using. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Let's give a round of applause.